not many psychoanalysts leave England for Australia. What made you leave? I wanted adventure. Uh, that was the sort of main... But there was a bit of history. My mother was born and brought up in Australia. Joan, my wife, was from Australia. And uh, although... Oh, no, I'd been here because we married here. And um, But I, when I say adventure, I did feel, you know, I was at the Tavistock and I was on three committees of the Institute of Psychoanalysis and I just felt I needed a bit more breadth and width and... Um, and uh, <clears throat> actually, Australia did provide that. And when I first arrived here, I found I had um, patients that um, I hadn't um, encountered in England before. Whether I was too shut off myself or what, but I, I, and I came to understand more primitive levels of, of, of happening. And there are other things that happened. I learned to fly, for instance, and... Uh, and uh, that may sound as if it's got nothing to do with psychoanalysis, but actually I learned a lot. It, it shook up a type of primitive level uh, of anxiety that had never been touched. And I don't think it would ever have been touched just by going into analysis again. And I'm, I'm quite sure that learning to fly, uh, which terrified me to start with, you know, and uh, shook up a primitive level. I think it was a primitive sort of child infantile level that was paralyzed one of the problems when you leave the priesthood in the catholic church you sort of have got qualifications within the church but when you leave you don't have any uh and so i had no qualifications i was doing a degree in psychology i was doing the analytic training but basically there was no one to give me a job but luckily through a sort of friend I got a job as a psychotherapist at Grendon Prison, and it was very enlightening for me. I, I used to, um, I'll tell you a story that always interested me, it still interests me, that uh, I used to take a group um, of prisoners once a week, um, a group therapy session, it lasted about two hours. But before taking them on, there were about eight of them, uh, people, um, uh, asked me, would you like to see their records? You know, their, um, and I said, no, I won't do that. I just, you know, meet them as they are. And when I started with them, they all said, oh, yes, we know you've read your uh, records and you just think we're a load of useless creatures and I know your attitude to us, etc., etc." I didn't say anything. I didn't tell them I hadn't read it. Um, but I just listened to them, and, you know, interacted with them. After about six weeks, something happened, and I decided to tell them uh, that I hadn't read their records. They were furious. It was very funny, uh, but it is to do with it sort of, it gave them an identity. Although I was a murderer or an arsonist or, a, you know, rapist or whatever, at least I'm a rapist, you know, I'm a this, you know, it gives me a bit of identity. Whereas in fact, what they were confronted with was someone coming to try and just know them, you know, without any of that external paraphernalia. You see, if you take someone like Bion and one looks at his early work, I don't think actually a, a, a work has really been done on sort of showing the way he left behind some previous theories and developed something of his own. But to me, one of the most important things, which is not really emphasized very often, if you asked um, what was the key thing that sort of motivated him, it was the idea that what human beings most long for is freedom. Uh, and that wasn't what we were taught. You see, what we were taught was Freud's view that um, <clears throat> what human beings want is to survive. And I don't think it's true, actually. I mean, uh, I'm, I've been very influenced by a philosopher called John McMurray, and he, he makes the point that, you know, people have decided even to give their lives for freedom rather than uh, uh, submit to some 
tyrannical regime or something. So my own view is that that is um, a change, but I think it's only changing very slowly. I, I personally think the other thing I think connected to this <clears throat> is if one asks, tries to split up and understand the human condition, I personally would understand that under three axes, religion, art, and uh, science, and psychoanalysis has tried to put itself within science. But actually, if you ask what art really is, whether it's music or painting or uh, poetry or literature, it's communication. And therefore, to my mind, psychoanalysis is part of communication. And I recently read Clau Bear's book, Difficulties in the Analytic Encounter. Clau Bear seems to me a bit forgotten today and is not at the forefront of psychoanalytic literature. For example, I didn't read him as a trainee, which is surprising. He is a very civilised voice and profoundly analytic. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. It doesn't matter so much if Clauber is remembered or not, but some of the principles is what matters. I mean, to me, it's a question of the, the truth of communication it doesn't matter if it's spoken by Freud or Jung or Lacan. It doesn't really matter. What one's trying to get at is the principles behind it. And, uh, uh, and those principles which freedom, uh, a sort of respect for someone else's life, the belief that actually communication between two people, um, if there's a real communication, that it's effective. Uh, I give you three quotes actually from the book, uh, which to my mind are very striking. Then I'll tell you two other things. <clears throat> he says, and this is in the essay called Elements of the Psychoanalytic Relationship and Their Therapeutic Implications. He says, the most neglected feature of the psychoanalytic relationship still seems to me to be that it is a relationship. A very peculiar relationship, but a definite one. Patient and analyst need one another. The patient comes to the analyst because of internal conflicts that prevent him from enjoying life, and he begins to use the analyst not only to resolve them, but increasingly as a receptacle for his pent-up feelings. But the analyst also needs the patient in order to crystallize and communicate his own thoughts, including some of his inmost thoughts, on intimate human problems, which can only grow organically in the context of this relationship. They cannot be shared and experienced in the same way with a colleague or even with a husband or wife. It's quite a striking statement, you see. And uh, uh, to try and answer your question, I have a feeling that's the thing that analysts don't like, that, you know, the fact that I can learn from a patient not only, I actually also think, especially with some very disturbed patients, unless they feel they can give the analyst something, and I don't mean money, uh, I don't think they'll ever get better. Uh, and uh, no doubt I've been influenced in that view from, by Clauber, but because uh, he was my analyst. And I'll just give you one other one, because to my mind it's a very significant one. He says, a woman undoubtedly suffering from paranoid tendencies, gave us her grounds for refusing treatment with a particular psychoanalyst that she could never be analyzed by someone who decorated his consulting room with such bad art. The patient herself had a considerable sensitivity for the visual arts, which she had demonstrated by discerning purchases. One psychoanalyst reported this decision as the arch evidence for the unreasonableness of the patient. A second thought that the perceptiveness which marked her character, perhaps in some respects even sharpened by her paranoid tendencies, had made her quickly understand that a psychoanalyst with such a taste in pictures would only with great difficulty acquire sufficient affinity with her own personality to understand it. When I was in analysis with um, John Clauber, I started seeing patients, and um, 
uh, a chap who'd had a therapy with various other people, but he came to see me. He was a teacher, and I arranged to see him twice a week. And um, then he rang about two days later and said, um, in the end, he only wanted to come once a week. I told this to Clauber, and Clauber said, well, he may um, come and see you for a while, then he'll bugger off and go and see someone else, and then he might ring you and want to come back and see you again, and so on. And I said, that's not very good, is it? And he said, it's his life, not yours. And I've never forgotten that. It's, um, uh, and I think it was sort of very elemental to Clara not to impose one's own uh, what is right for one or even for a system upon someone. The other thing that was very, very striking to me, um, when I took on my first training case, um, after about the f first or second session, I sort of reported it and I, I said to him, but I didn't make a transference interpretation. And he said, well, what's the purpose of making a transference interpretation? And I said, sort of hesitant, well, uh, it's to promote psychic change. And there was a pause, and then he said, it's to remove an obstacle that exists between the analyst and the patient. And that had a tremendous, because I realized in all the seminars, I you know, felt I should genuflect every time the word transference was used. But actually what he was saying, the agent, the generative factor, is the real core contact between these two people, between the analyst and the patient. And, the, and if there's something that gets in the way of that, that's what has to be got rid of and, and so on. And uh, interestingly, even about five or six years ago, I, I quoted this in an email to Tom Ogden. And Tom Ogden was very struck by it. He said he never heard anyone mention that before. So my own view is he had a type of attitude that was way ahead of his time, not even ahead of his time. It was from a different dimension somehow. But, uh, you know, quite why he hasn't been recognized, I'm not sure. And I have a feeling it's to do with, because those things he said, you know, it's his life, not yours, and it's um, an obstacle between the analyst and the patient that it's an actual relation between the core of one person and the core of another. I mean, that can happen outside of psychoanalysis. And I have a feeling that there's a sort of need somehow, this is our precious domain, and no one else has it, you know, outside, which is not true. About five years ago, I flew into Copenhagen, and then I got the little plane that flew to Aarhus, and when I arrived there in the evening, it's about an hour's drive into the city, and a taxi driver, I hailed a taxi driver, and he um, uh, picked me up and took me into the city. But just after he'd started driving, he said uh, to me, um, what's your profession? So I said, I'm a psychoanalyst. And he started by making some of the odd joke. And then he said, but there's something in this happened to me in the taxi a short while ago that might interest you. And um, he told me that a man had got in and asked him to drive him to the harbor, or who sits on a harbor. And when he arrived at the harbor, the chap said, how much do I owe you? And he told him and he paid him. And then he said, I'm going to jump in the harbor and commit suicide. And the taxi driver said, I had a central locking system, and I put it on. And he said, no, you're going to sit here and talk to me. And the man told him that two weeks before, his wife had died of cancer. And then a week later, his son was killed in a car crash. And the taxi driver said, I spoke with him for two hours. And at the end of the two hours, the man said, please drive me home. And I thought, heavens, you know, with all my training, I wouldn't have done as well as that. But it's slight to prove, I'm, I mean, I think that's a rather dramatically sort of exceptional case. But uh, there is communication between people uh, that's healing of that, I've got no doubt, you know. Yeah, being real. But I think it's, 
an understanding that comes from what I call the core of one person that touches the core of another. And I think that's what Clauber understood, actually. And the other thing I personally think it was a good thing about Clauber, he had certain prejudices. Um, and there were certain things he didn't understand. But he was quite open about them. So when the analysis was over, I sort of knew what was essential, and I knew what was just part of his prejudice. But we all have prejudices and outlooks and sort of so on. And we hide them, but he was open about them. And I actually think that's an advantage. I mean, you know, it wouldn't be good if it was, I suppose, too much. But, but nevertheless, he, so, I mean, I probably sort of gather that I come from the sort of English upper middle class and was shipped off to one of these public schools, boarding schools. And I don't think he understood that world, actually. I mean, he, he laughed about it, but I don't think he really understood it. And how relevant is psychoanalysis today? Well, you see, I think if you, if you ask the conservatives who are against it, I don't think they would have the view that uh, communication is the, the sort of the, the ground assumption on which psychoanalysis is built. Uh, they would cling very closely to the idea that it's a science uh, and uh, therefore this causes that. And uh, I also think that's wrong. I mean, um, it doesn't, if you hear, you know, that someone's uh, mother died when they were age five or something, and the father, you know, was nasty, etc. And uh, they say, well, this is what caused this person's neurosis. It's not true. It's, uh, it, it may have contributed things, but uh, you could have two people under the same, so, and another one, it wouldn't have had this effect. And therefore, the, the, type of realization that there are what one might call central notions inside of a person that may govern the way they think and feel. I mean, <clears throat> to me, one of the most important things in the attachment literature is the finding that if a mother can reflect on her own experiences, even if they've been bad, the child can uh, attach securely. But you see, the mother's not doing it in order for the child to. It's just a natural endowment, and yet it has this effect, which is striking, actually, if you really think of it. You know, it's... Um, um, so... Uh, <clears throat> and I personally think it's the same thing with analysts with a patient. It's... Um, it's if there's some reflective capacity. I mean, Marion Milner was a great promoter of this idea. Um, it, it, it generates something uh, in the other, just like the child is able to attach securely. Incidentally, I personally think the language is wrong with attach securely. My own view is that the, that the infant can relate to the mother, and there's therefore uh, the enjoyment of companionship. What made you leave the priesthood and what led you into psychoanalysis? In a word, I left uh, the priesthood because I ceased to believe. And that remains the, the case. I'd, uh, but it, it goes a bit deeper than that. I don't believe in the Catholic system. I don't believe when the priest bends over the bread and wine and says words that that turns into the body and blood of Christ. And that, I mean, it, may sound extraordinary, but it is nevertheless absolutely a central Catholic belief. Leaving the church, I mean, was huge for me, and, and it, you know, it was tremendously upsetting to my family. I came from a big Catholic tribe, and, you know, my uncle tried to get my father to disinherit me, and, you know, it was, um, and various members wouldn't talk to me for a long time, and, and some people never would talk to me. And, so, I, I, you know, it was a, a difficult thing. When I was in the church, I'd been ordained, that's right, and I was first in a parish in East London. 
I wrote a novel called A Priest's Affair, which is sort of based on that. And um, But when I began to realize I had emotional difficulties, and so I went to an analyst, not Clauber, I went to an analyst uh, twice a week, and that led me to leave, actually. And then later, when I sort of decided to pursue that sort of field, I did a degree in psychology. Then I applied to the Institute of Psychoanalysis, and I was, you know, I was accepted. You see, the kernel of uh, religion, I personally think, lies in the fact that there is a universe. Uh, we don't know how or why. There is existence. And I, I find it hard to explain, but it, to me it's always a, a sort of fantastic fact. And it's not something that science can explain. I've seen Dawkins on television trying to say, you know, that scientists will soon be able to make something from nothing. It's nonsense. Uh, and I don't mean by realizing that, that there is this fantastic effect of existence. I don't mean by that that God has created it. And just taking that just fact that 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 there is existence and we do not know it, why or how, it's not explainable. What I'm trying to get at is uh, I do think there's a, a, a sort of mystery of certain things that the mind cannot grasp. And that's, to my mind, always been very important, you know, to, to recognize we cannot actually grasp everything. I'm absolutely sure of this, that um, uh, when an analysis is finished, uh, everything has not been understood. And uh, I quite like it, actually, when finishing with someone to try and at least sort of perhaps open up the areas that have not properly been understood or and so on. And I think all that attitude comes from really what religion is about. Um, my own view is that Catholicism, Judaism, Muslimhood, etc., actually distort religion. They, they, they sort of, you know, into the dietary laws and this and that and the other. It's nothing to do with that. And I think it gets in the way of what religion is really about. I think every human action is motivated uh, not just by a single thing. It's motivated by self-interest, by uh, interest in the other, interest in the subject. There's a, there's a confluence of... Uh, of um, of motives that go to make up the action. Uh, to me, it's very important to realize that there is a, a self-interested one which is not really in any way promoting of um, sort of a, call it a, a generative intercourse. Uh, I suppose that's sort of fundamentally what I think. The normal view of narcissism is that the ego has taken its own self as um, as a love object. To my mind, that's secondary, that, that there's been a refusal to take what I refer to as the life giver, uh, which is a bit similar to what I was saying, just about the fact of existence, that that's primary. And it's the refusal of that that then leads me to take myself. And I, I feel... I feel that's very important, really, and that's the sort of central sort of uh, issue. You obviously know a great deal about psychoanalytic theory and have written extensively about it. Bion has become very important to you and your wife, Joan, and you both wrote a book about him. Would you like to say a little more about that, please? Okay, I qualified in 1976 and became a member at the beginning of 1977. And in 1977 and 1978 and 1979, Bion came from California to London, and I was at the Tavistock. He gave seminars at the Tavistock, and he also gave seminars at the Institute of Psychoanalysis to the Klein group to which I went. And 
as soon as I heard him, I thought, this is different. But funnily enough, it was not dissimilar from this philosopher who taught me ontology 20 years before. It was coming from a different type of place, and I sort of recognized it. And um, I just tell you this because it made a tremendous, you know, sort of shock to me. At one of the seminars at the Klein Group, he uh, suddenly said, um, most analysts do not believe that this strange conversation works. And I was amazed at this, you know, sort of. Um, and I was going for supervision to him two days later, so I said to him, you know, I was amazed at this statement that you made. And he looked at me, it must have been for about two minutes, you know, staring at me. And he, he said, Nevertheless, I've listened to many, many clinical presentations, and I think it's true. But, you see, what interested me, he never used a term when I had those supervisions, that like clinical material. He said, tell me the next bit of the conversation or the next communication. Uh, you don't have to invent terms like clinical material if you really believe that a conversation works. It, it's a sort of false parade, I think. So there was something about him that, that to my mind, was it sort of... Uh, to me, he lifted the thing into a different sort of sphere. There's no doubt of all the analysts, uh, he had the greatest influence. And Neville, is there anything you would like to say that I haven't asked that you feel might be relevant? Yeah, I've, I've, in the last um, six, seven years, it's connected to this interest I've developed in the treatment of psychotic patients. I might just say something about that, because the view is uh, that these psychotic patients, you know, can't be treated with psychotherapy. And strange to say, it's even with the Kleinians who've tended to stress the primitive, I've noticed they tend to be saying it's, you know, that, that these patients can't be treated. But... Um, of that, I've, there's someone I've supervised, and she started seeing someone in a psychiatric hospital who'd um, uh, cut herself, put bags over her head, swallowed knives, and so on. Most people say she could not be treated. And th this uh, patient had two children and because of her state, you know, they were taken from her care and they were looked after by, by other people. Um, but anyhow, this therapist just worked away at seeing her twice a week. Um, and uh, today, that patient, this is sort of six years later now, um, uh, she's back. She's well, she's living in her own flat, looking after her children. She's finished a cookery course and is uh, working as a chef in a restaurant. Extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And, uh, but she's just one of quite a number of cases. And uh, so my view is that these patients can be treated. I personally think there's an assumption behind a lot of analytical thinking, which is that... Um, that the ego or the self is fully formed. So it will often be said, you know, to a patient that they're denying their pain, for instance, or denying the capacity, denying their capacity to grieve or to mourn or whatever. But the assumption behind that is there is a fully formed ego able to. But say that that ego has not, in fact, been formed. And I was very struck some years ago, a man came into my consulting room and as he walked in, he said, uh, you know, doctor, I've never been formed. But what struck me about it was, uh, I think it's true of many people, but he realized it, you know, and he came for it. So to my mind, it then alters what the whole process is. It's, uh, as it were, to try and generate the formation and the, there's a, like a prime function in the personality. I'd talk about the core self. But there are also 
subsidiary functions like the capacity to bear pain, to imagine, to think, to, to um, uh, conceptualize, to abstract, and so on. And quite often these are not well developed. And so to me the problem therefore clinically is how do I act in relation to this person to um, help promote that which is not well formed? And it, 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 it throws a completely different light on the process to my mind. So that's, I think, probably the main thing that I haven't spoken about.